Hi, I'm Ashley Branson, and today, with the help of my partner Scott Branson, I'm going to teach you about case conceptualization. In this video, we will cover, first, why case conceptualization is important, and, second, how exactly one goes about developing a case conceptualization. So right now, you might be asking yourself, why exactly should I invest my precious time and energy into developing a thorough case conceptualization? Well, that's fair. Case conceptualization is time consuming, and I'll tell you exactly why it's worth it. Because case conceptualization is literally one of the most important tools we have as counselors. One reason why this is true is because case conceptualization allows us to see the big picture. This helps us to understand our clients in context, just like putting together a puzzle. And it also helps us to organize our ideas so that we can make more connections and associations than we would be able to otherwise. So, by seeing the big picture, understanding our clients in context, and organizing our ideas through connections and associations, we better understand our clients' experiences, and as a result, we have more empathy for our clients. When we are in session with our clients, we are generally focused on being intensely present. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we're listening to our clients' experiences in a non-judgmental way. While listening, we are simultaneously seeking to understand these experiences so that we can have empathy for our clients. And we're expressing this empathy to our clients through our nonverbals and our reflections of feelings, thoughts, and meanings. What we are working to avoid doing is getting stuck in our heads, because this makes it impossible for us to connect with our clients in a meaningful way. Now, that's not to say that we aren't making connections and associations while we are in session with our clients. Of course we are. And we share these connections with our clients through skills like immediacy and reflection of meaning. However, there is no real way to share all of these connections and associations going on inside our heads with our clients in the room. I mean, if we did, we would be the only ones talking, and that's not good counseling. Let's stop for a minute and think about how exactly our brains process information and ideas. At any given time, we may suddenly have an idea that pops into our head. Usually, if we're not too tired or hungry or preoccupied, then we are able to link our ideas with other similar or related ideas or concepts. We link our ideas through connections and associations. So now, let's think about our short-term memory. It's not a computer, and as a result, it has only so much processing power. This means our short-term memory is going to be somewhat limited by the amount of information it can process at any given time. We can only hold so many ideas online at once, and the more ideas we have at once, the harder it becomes for us to hold on to these ideas and to connect them with other related ideas and concepts. Luckily, we have case conceptualization to come to our rescue. Case conceptualization gives us a way to hold on to and organize these ideas so we can keep them in our working memory. So, once we are able to capture all of these ideas and organize them, Suddenly, we can make connections and associations that weren't quite so obvious before. Why exactly is that? Well, it's like we were all the way zoomed in before, focused on just a few ideas, and then case conceptualization helped us to zoom out and see that elusive big picture. Essentially, case conceptualization is like being given a fully functional GPS, when before you were just driving around and asking random people for directions. In a sense, case conceptualization provides a map to our client's internal world. It's almost like calibrating our internal compass so that it mirrors our client's internal compass. This allows us to view situations and experiences in a brand new way, and it helps us to understand another person's perspective in a way that perhaps we couldn't understand before. This gives us a unique glimpse into our client's worldview all of which together serves to increase our empathy for our clients, which makes us better counselors. Now that we have a good understanding of why case conceptualization is important, let's actually dive into the process itself and see how case conceptualization works. Case conceptualization looks something like this. Let's say you're a counselor in training at the University Counseling Center and you're sitting in session with your client, Nate. 
Now, Nate has been coming for the last seven weeks, and today is your eighth session with him. So Nate is sitting directly across from you, and he is describing a recent phone conversation he had with his girlfriend, Mary. Like we said before, when we are in session with clients, we are focused on being intensely present. And luckily, that's just what you're doing. You are carefully listening to Nate's every word. So Nate says, I just can't stand it anymore, you know? It's like she's so needy all of the time. I constantly have to reassure her. Being in a relationship with her is seriously exhausting. And it happens. An idea pops into your head. Holy crap. This is exactly how he described his relationship with his mother last week. Okay, so we don't want to say that part aloud. Your idea about Nate's relationship with his mother mirroring the relationship with his girlfriend is what we call metalog. Okay, so I know this is going to sound a bit counterintuitive, but stay with me for just a moment. When I think about counseling, in a way, it's a lot like multitasking. So let's consider multitasking for just a second. I'm sitting at home on my couch, writing a paper, and in the background, I have some relaxation music playing. So right now, let's say about um, 80% of my mental processing energy is going to focusing on writing my paper. This means that the other 20% is going to things like listening to the music or wondering what I'm going to have for dinner later. Now back to Nate. We are doing a similar thing right now in the counseling room with him. I mean, in a way, we're really multitasking. Let's think about it. Say, at this moment, about 80% of our mental processing power is going to being intensely present with Nate. Right now. Right in this moment. Where does that leave the leftover 20% of our mental processing power? Hopefully not thinking about our dinner. All jokes aside, though, the other 20% of our mental processing power is taking note of our metalog, and it's busy filing this metalog away for later, when we're going to sit down and start working on our case conceptualization. Now, it is important to note that we don't always file away this metalog, this information that we get from the other 20% of our brain. Sometimes, we are going to want to use this metalog in session. For example, let's say instead of metalog related to Nate's relationship with his mother, instead, you thought to yourself, yeah, he really looks exhausted. You might use that particular metalog for immediacy instead of case conceptualization. It's just going to depend on what the metalog is. So back to our case conceptualization. Your eighth session with Nate has come to an end, and now it is time to sit down and work on your case conceptualization. Where should we start? Well, let's start with the basics. Nate's demographic information. Nate is in late adolescence. He is a 17-year-old straight male attending his freshman year of college. He graduated from high school an entire year ahead of schedule, and he describes himself as a motivated student. Nate is studying engineering, and he is hoping to get a high-paying job when he finishes school. Nate describes himself as half Hispanic and half black. He reports that he is the first person in his family to attend college. His family consists of himself, his mother, his father, his older brother, and his younger sister. Nate describes his family as middle class and Catholic. Okay, so that is a lot of information to hold online at once. Let's put it off to the side for a moment and think about the presenting concern. Nate stated at his initial therapy appointment that he was having some trouble transitioning from living at home with his parents to living on his own at college. This sounds like a developmental life stage concern Nate is struggling with a normal life transition. He is wanting autonomy and independence, and at the same time, he wants to be taken care of and to be free from responsibility. Nate also stated during his initial session that part of what made his transition to college so difficult was that he felt a great deal of pressure to perform well in school. Nate's dad worked hard to secure a middle-class job without a college degree, and he wants Nate to be wealthy to not have to work as hard as he has had to. Nate often states that he is worried about disappointing his family, and he studies hard to make sure that he is academically successful. Nate doesn't want to end up like his siblings. Nate describes his brother Mitchell as a disappointment. 
Nate says that Mitchell was always getting in trouble when they were younger. He dropped out of high school his senior year, and he recently came out to the family as gay. Nate had a strong conflictual reaction to Mitchell coming out. On the one hand, Nate stated that he would always love his brother, no matter what, and on the other hand, he felt like this was directly going against the family's Catholic faith. Nate describes staying in contact with Mitchell, despite the rest of the family cutting him off. Nate describes his sister Maria as following in Mitchell's shoes. She's been getting in trouble at school, skipping class, and she was recently caught shoplifting. During one of his sessions, Nate stated that he thought that his brother and sister got into trouble so much because his mom is always sick. Nate reports that his mother, Roseanne, was injured in a car accident five years ago. Ever since the car accident, she has had difficulty getting around. Nate said that the car accident messed up her right knee pretty badly, and she could no longer keep her job as an activity director at the local nursing home. Nate describes his mother as depressed and chronically ill. He describes feeling like he has to take care of her all the time, because she's always down. That leaves Nate and his father, Alfonso. Nate describes his relationship with his father as close, and he states that he wants nothing more than to make his father proud. In fact, Nate describes wanting to be his father's hero. Nate states that he respects and admires his father for both his perseverance and his ability to overcome a number of life challenges. He reports that his father immigrated to the United States from Mexico at the age of seven. As a result of Nate's father's ethnicity, he faced a great deal of discrimination and racism. Despite these challenges, he managed to learn English, be successful in school, attain citizenship, secure a good job, overcome an alcohol problem, and provide for his family. Nate also describes his father as admirable for staying with his mother and caring for her despite no longer being happy in his marriage. Nate states that he believes his father stays with his mother because of the family's religious belief that divorce is wrong. Nate describes his relationship with his father as a major source of social support. Nate generally goes home on the weekends to be with his father and they talk on the phone throughout the week. Nate has made a few friends at school, however, he reports struggling to feel accepted by his peers. Nate relates this back to his ethnicity, stating that because he is biracial, he has never really fit into any group. Nate describes facing discrimination and racism. Nate tells you that he has been going out drinking on the weekends, and he reports feeling shameful about getting drunk, but also finding it easier to fit in after a few drinks. Nate is often worried about disappointing his father. Specifically, Nate is anxious that his father will find out that he is continuing to speak to his brother Mitchell and that he has been occasionally drinking on the weekends. Nate describes the idea of disappointing his father as unbearable stating that he is the only one in the family that his father has left, and that he has to prove to his father that he did not fail as a parent. The majority of Nate's family is in conflict. Nate feels stuck in an impossible situation, where he believes he must rescue the entire family. He works diligently to prove to his father that he is a good parent, by working hard in school to be financially successful. He goes out of his way to try to please his mother, to lift her depression, and to take care of her. He secretly stays in communication with his older brother in an effort to keep him connected to the family. And he worries about his little sister and feels responsible for keeping her out of trouble. Nate has a number of strengths. He is a hard worker and a good student. He has a great deal of compassion and caring for others, and he is persistent and courageous. He tries hard to please others and to make them happy. So what exactly do we know about Nate that wasn't quite so obvious at the beginning? Well, now we know that Nate has learned that the majority of his self-worth comes from pleasing others, rescuing them, and taking care of them. While Nate's compassion and caring for others is a strength, he sometimes does this at the expense of himself. Nate believes that it is unacceptable to fail, and as a result, he constantly feels under pressure to be better. This leaves Nate feeling like he's never good enough, no matter how hard he tries, and it also leaves him with constant anxiety about failing and being rejected by others. This is what we were talking about before, when we said that understanding Nate's worldview and context would help us to see the big picture and make connections and associations that weren't quite so obvious before. Given Nate's life circumstances, it makes sense that he is struggling, and it is apparent that he is doing the best that he can. As Nate's counselor, you can help him to gain awareness of these larger connections, associations, and themes. Our case conceptualization serves as a foundation on which to build our counseling. It helps us to understand our clients' worldviews 
and it allows us to have more empathy and understanding for our clients. Further, we can use case conceptualization to inform things like diagnosis and treatment planning. Lastly, we can take our case conceptualization and look at it through the lens of multiple theories, further expanding our ability to see the big picture and to make even more connections and associations. So there you have it, case conceptualization, one of the most important tools that we have as counselors.